Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. How many are ready for the word of the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. Two places in the word of God. I want to read from uh, Psalm 1 and Galatians 5. I will read first from Psalm 1. Beginning with verse number 1, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And the man that does this, the blessed man, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth his fruit. Everyone say his fruit. His fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's the blessed man. And then it contrasts the blessed man with the ungodly. Notice the difference. The ungodly are not so. But are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Galatians 5, two verses of scripture, verses 22 and 23. The Apostle Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Everyone say fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Amen. And tonight, for a little while, I want to teach, this will be the second lesson. If you want a title, we'll call it the fruit of the spirit. Lesson two. Amen. I want to talk about being fruitful tonight. Is there anybody that's interested in being fruitful in living for God? I don't know about you, but I want to be everything God wants me to be. And I I, I want to tell you this at the start of this message. Every man in this place, every woman in this place, God has a purpose for your life. He intends for you to be fruitful. Amen. And I want to be fruitful in living for God. If you feel that way, let's put our Bibles down and let's pray that God would bless the word of the Lord to our spirit tonight. Jesus, we love you. and God, we thank you that we're in your presence. Thank you to be in your house. God, I ask that you would speak to our hearts. Let our hearts be open to your word. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Before you're seated, look at somebody by you. Tell them it is good to see you in the house of the Lord. Amen. Galatians 5 speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. In Psalm chapter number 1 speaks of a man that is blessed that produces fruit. And I want to begin at the, at the outset of this uh, message tonight to remind us that it is the will of God for everybody in this house tonight to produce fruit. The Bible says that A man that is blessed um, doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. There are things that we do not do as blessed people. But we are not just people that are uh, separated, not just the people that have removed ourselves, while that is a part of living for God. But we are separated unto something and blessed to something. And the Bible says that 
The blessed man does not walk, stand, or sit in those places, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Amen. And I want to just ask somebody tonight, is there anybody that still delights in the Word of God? Is there anybody that just gets Holy Ghost happy about the Word of God, about the preaching of the Word, about reading your Bible? Anybody thankful for God's Word tonight? Amen. And I would just encourage you, if, if you're here tonight, and uh, it's been a while since you really dove into your Bible, it's time to get back. It's time to get back in the Word. It's time to love the Word. It's time to eat the Word. It's time to uh, ingest the Word of God. Because the Bible says that the man that does these things, that does not walk, stand, or sit in those places, but does delight in the law of the Lord, would be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And uh, I, I'll just tell you, as I read this psalm, this is one of my, my favorite psalms of the 150 that, that are in our Bible. I love the metaphor that the, the psalmist brings about the blessed man. Describes him as being planted. Everyone say planted. And also as bringing forth or producing fruit. Everyone say Fruit. And this is an important part of being blessed, is being planted and bringing forth fruit. I I believe it's the will of God for us to be blessed, but it's also God's will for us to be blessed uh, for a reason. God doesn't just pour out his blessings just to see how much blessing he can give us, although I think as, as, as any father, he enjoys blessing his people. But God blesses us in order that we would be a blessing. This is what God spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter number 12. It is is maybe the most basic fundamental principles of blessing. God spoke to Abraham and said, I am blessing you that you might be a blessing. And I want to remind us tonight, that's why God blesses his people, so that we can bless other people. This man that was blessed was not just blessed so that he could sit at home and be blessed, but he was blessed so that he could be planted, bring forth fruit to bless everyone around. Again, I want to tell you, I believe it's the will of God for us to be a blessing that produces fruit for other people. Can you say amen? And so I want to talk tonight about fruitfulness. Everybody say fruitfulness. I want to talk in terms of the the fruit of the Spirit. We are still in the introduction of this, this lesson. We're going to get into Galatians 5. I believe, uh, verses 22 and 23, I believe, uh, are the next time we teach on this. But uh, fruitfulness is what it's all about. And I, I want to I talk to us tonight about the beauty of being fruitful. And I have several important points, several points that I want to bring to your attention about being uh, fruitful. How many, again, want to be fruitful in living for God? Number one, if you're taking notes, the Bible lets us know that being fruitful tells other people things about God. The Bible lets us know that when the world sees a fruitful saint of God, it is a sign to others of a future place that is to come. I want to direct your attention first to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. The Bible tells in that passage that there were, uh, this is when Joshua sent 12 spies into the promised land. You remember that story? The Bible says that God told, uh, or Joshua sent out these, excuse me, Moses sent out these 12 spies of which Joshua was one. And these 12 spies went into the land of promise to give a report back to Israel. The Bible says that when they went, they came back with things in their hands. When they went to get a report for Israel, they came back with physical signs of the promised land. How many remember tonight what they brought back? They brought back fruit. They brought back fruits. They brought back grapes, the Bible says, the clusters of grapes that were so big that they, they took these, this cluster of grapes and put them 
on one staff, on a stick between two men. The stick went from one man's shoulder to the other man's shoulder and hanging over in a huge cluster. I don't know if the grapes were giant or if the cluster itself was giant. I get the feeling probably both were the case. Whatever it was, two men were required to carry one cluster of grapes. The Bible says they brought it back and they brought it to the, to the, to the people of the congregation and they showed them the fruit of the lamb. And they told the people, we come into the land whither you sent us. And surely, they're talking about the land where they're going. It floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. When they came back, that fruit was an indicator. It was a sign of a better place, a place that they were going. And I I just want to remind this church tonight that it's important that we have fruit Because when the world sees saints of God that are producing love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, it's a sign of a better place. When they see, listen, we live in a goofy, messed up world. You don't have to look very far. You don't have to read very much of of your newspaper or or, uh, on your phone how messed up our world is. In this world where... where, uh, uh, there's, there's so much chaos and so much violence and so much hatred and so much ugliness. When they see a people that have love and joy and peace, it's a sign that there's a promised land. There's another place. There's another land. I'm just here to tell you, I want to be a sign to this world that heaven is my home. I'm not living here forever. I'm headed to a place called heaven. Can you say Amen. Amen. We, we live in a world where hospitals are a necessity. We live in a world where a police force is a necessity. And uh, in fact, uh, this church is, 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 is really in need of the police of late. <laughs> Apparently we're learning that catalytic converters are really in demand right now. And, uh, and what, that, what that means is our buses, they've been, been nailing the catalytic converters on our buses. And uh, so pray that God would protect our vehicles. Amen. I mean that. Let's pray about that. And uh, pretty soon we're probably going to have to add a little, uh, little fenced off area over there uh, just to, to keep, keep people out of that. But, but we live in a goofy world. We need the police. We, we, we live in a world where there, we, our nation has an army and, and uh, the army has weapons. It has bombs. It has all of these things. And, and uh, when you go to... Uh, different stores, you see uh, security guards out front. There's a reason for that. When you, many of you in your home, you have, a, have an alarm system. And, and uh, different uh, businesses around town will have fences with razor wire. Amen. But I, I just want to tell you that when we get to heaven, there's not going to be any hospitals. There's not going to be a police force. There's not going to be armies. There's not going to be bombs. There's not going to be security guards. There will no, be no alarm systems, no razor wire. There will be no thefts of catalytic converters in heaven. Amen. I'm looking forward to that place. Can you say amen? And I want to tell you that the world, when they see the people of God living right, when they see the people of God that are living in a way where we don't need to call the police uh, or the people don't need to call the police on us necessarily. They don't need to call the police on us because some of you that maybe used to do drugs and alcohol, aren't you glad God has set you free from that? Amen. Some of you used to know what it was like on a Friday night for the police to come knocking on your door to shut down your party. Amen. I, I, uh, there was a, a new convert in this church. Somebody was telling me about a while back he was at a party uh, with somebody here in the church. They were at a fellowship. And at the fellowship the police came driving by and as the police came driving by the man in the church just waved at the police well the other guy was the new convert was like ready to run to the backyard you know every experience he's ever had at a party when the police showed up it was not good and he saw the man wait he said why'd you wave at the police he said i was just telling them hi and, and he said i i've never i've never had that kind of interaction well i'm gonna just tell you god's people God's people should not have the police called on them. God's people uh, should be a representation 
of a future place, of a place called heaven. When they see people that when we get sick, we go to the altar and we ask for the elders of the church to anoint us with oil. And we pray the prayer of faith because we know that God can heal us. How many know we serve a healer tonight? Amen. Anybody ever been healed in your body by the power of the name of Jesus? Amen. What I'm telling you is that is a small slice of heaven. It's heaven coming down where there'll be no more hospitals, no more doctors, no more wheelchairs, no more uh, any of that other stuff. When people see people that have love and joy and peace in their life, it's like a small slice of heaven come down. It's like they're seeing a land that flows with milk and honey, and we are a testimony. There is a better place. I'm going to tell you, I ain't living just for this world. I'm living in this world, but this world is not my home. I'm living in this world, and I am a happy camper, but this ain't what I'm all about. I'm not living in this world with this world in mind. I'm living in this world with a future promise of heaven. And someday there really is going to be a trumpet that sounds. Someday there really is going to be uh, the voice of the archangel and, and God calling us home. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. Anybody interested in that tonight? Man, and when God's people are fruitful, I'm going to tell you, it matters that we behave as Christians. I'm going to tell you, when we behave like Christian people, we are sending a message and a signal that there is a place called heaven. Amen. And so fruitfulness is a sign of a place called heaven. I also want to talk to you about fruitfulness as being a sign of maturity. Amen. And I, 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 I was reading about this. It, and uh, people that study trees, horticulturists, and people that, that delve into this, they, they talked about uh, the fact that really with a healthy tree, you should not expect to produce very, uh, for a tree to produce very much, uh, if it's an apple tree, very much apples. Uh, or if it's a pear tree, very much pears until around the third to the fifth year of, of, of planting the tree. And they said the reason for this is you want the tree to be mature before it begins to produce fruit. I, I heard a story, and I, I've told this before, and I've had, to, I've had to tell several in this church at different times. I've, I've told new converts this at times about a, a, a pastor that I know of. He he lived, I believe it was up in Ohio, and he told the story that when he was there, he planted, he, he moved to the, the area, and he planted a bunch of uh, fruit trees on his property. I believe they were, I believe they were apple trees, and he said that very first year, the very first year, it began to produce a bunch of blooms on the tree. There were flowers all over the tree, and he got so excited, he, he, he was thinking, man, I'm going to get fruit the very first year. That's pretty cool. The very first, these are little bitty trees. And he's like, I'm going to get fruit the very first year. And so he had some friends that were, uh, that were kind of like farmers. And, and he began to talk to these guys. And, um, and uh, you know, they were wearing their overalls and so on. And, and he said, guys, I got these trees. The very first year I plant, I'm going to get a bunch of apples this year. Well, they looked at him. And in their slow way, they said, preacher, you know what you need to do? He said, what? He said, you need to go and pull all those blooms off of that tree. He said, what are you talking about? Preacher, if you don't pull those blooms off that tree, that tree will produce fruit this very first year. But the problem is, is that tree is using all of its energy to produce fruit instead of putting its roots down. And preacher, inevitably, there's going to be a storm. It's just part of what happens around here. The winds are going to blow. And, and if that tree doesn't have the proper root system, those trees are all going to fall over. And that preacher said, do you have any idea how hard it was for me to go to that fruit tree and begin to pluck the flowers off that tree? He said, I, I pulled them off, and every one of them would have been an apple. Every one of those would have been a piece of fruit. I pulled them off, and I dropped them on the ground. 
And then he made this statement. He said, but I am more interested in a life of fruitfulness than in one year of fruitfulness. And I've come to tell the church tonight, God is more interested in a life of fruitfulness. God is interested in you producing year after year after year instead of just one year. And so sometimes there may be a desire that you have. Maybe there's something as soon as you get the Holy Ghost, you're like, I'm ready. Where's the pulpit? I want to preach. As soon as you get in church, I'm ready. Let me, let me ask, whatever the case may be. And sometimes God has to reach out and pull the, the bloom off and say, just wait a while. It's time for you now to produce roots. It's time for you now to put your roots way down. I'm talking to somebody tonight. Fruitfulness is a sign of maturity. It's the will of God for us to be a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season year after year after year. I'm here to encourage a new convert tonight. God wants you to be fruitful this year, but he wants you to be fruitful for 10 years from now, the rest of your life, a blessing in everything that you do. I read in the book of uh, Joshua chapter 5, the Bible says of the nation of Israel, that when the nation of Israel had, uh, well, basically on their way to Canaan land, how many remember what they ate as they were traveling through the wilderness? They basically ate angel food. Every morning God would give them, you know, give them little baby food. I mean, it was like Gerber's, you know, baby food. He, he made it for them. They didn't have to do nothing. He'd, he'd, he'd say, open up, open up. You know, when you feed a baby, you... You do all kinds of things to get them to eat. You give them the best. You give them the easiest. You give them little mushy stuff. It's like pre-chewed. It's, it's easy for them to eat. And God gave Israel that kind of food. The Bible says that when they came, though, into the land of Canaan, that they didn't get manna anymore. I'm going to tell you, there comes a point. Let me say it this way. When you first get living for God, God will give you milk. God will do everything he can. God will get, make it easy on you because you're a baby. And the Bible says as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. But church, there does come a point where we have to grow up. Amen. There does come a point where we got to stand up and mature. God says, no more am I going to the blender and taking the steak and making meat juice out of it. I'm done giving you soup, Gerber's no more, angel food no more. It's time for you to eat men food, grown-up food, adult food. It's time for you to grow up. And so Israel, God said, I'm not giving you manna anymore, but he gave them fruit of the land of Canaan. And I'm talking to somebody it's time for some of us to grow up amen anybody interested in being mature in living for God amen it's not the will of God uh, for us to be the same next year as we are today I, I I thank God we've got elders in this church that are mature that are representations of what it means to be strong in living for God that have lived for God for many many years I believe it's the will of God for us to be strong in living for God can you say amen Amen. I would tell you also, we're talking about fruitfulness. Everybody say fruitfulness. Fruitfulness does not have to stop as we mature in living for God. Here's your verse, Psalm 92 and 14. Psalm 92 and 14 says this, They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Everybody say old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Hallelujah. Well, I'm fulfilling that promise right there. Amen. Fruitful in old age. The Bible lets us know that it's the will of God for us to continue to bring forth fruit in old age. L let me just tell you right now, I am thankful for elders in this church that are still fruitful in living for God. I, as I look across this congregation, I, 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 one of the greatest things I see in this place is gray hair, white hair, in some cases no hair. I'm talking about elders that God has given this church. The strength of this church is elders, experience, and wisdom. Is there anybody that's thankful that God has given us elders? Amen. Can I just stop and tell some elders tonight, you have a place in the kingdom of God. 
Amen. You have a place. In any, how many believe that tonight? You have a, an important place in living for God. Paul told, uh, or excuse me, John wrote in his epistle, he said, I write to you young men because you were strong. But he wrote to fathers because they were, had experience and had wisdom. And, and uh, there were some wise elders in this house tonight. And it's a, it's a lie of the devil that says you have no place in living for God. Amen. I want to just stop and say this. I I hope this makes sense. When I think about the past year and I think about uh, COVID, I, I, uh, I don't want to over spiritualize it, but it's interesting that that particular uh, uh, year and problem uh, attacked so many things that we do in living for God. Amen. It, 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 with COVID, you weren't supposed to lay hands on the sick. With COVID, you're not supposed to come to church. With COVID, you're not supposed to take communion. With COVID, you're not supposed to baptize. Can I tell you, we have to baptize. We have to lay hands on the sick. We have to take communion, and we have to come to church. Uh, COVID attacked fellowship. How many know we need fellowship? But something else that's interesting to me, and I'm not over-spiritualizing stuff, uh, but COVID was very specifically directed at elders. I'm here to tell you tonight, uh, I, I, again, I'm not here to over-spiritualize and make a parable out of everything, but let me just tell some elders tonight, uh, this church loves you God loves you. If there ever was a time you're needed, it's now. Thank God for elders that are fruitful in living for God. In fact, I'm going to tell you, a blessed church has a bunch of elders. In fact, did you know that that there was a curse in the Bible pronounced on the house of Eli where God said there will never be an elder in your house again? That was a curse from God. Now, I know that curse involved the fact that there would be, uh, obviously, a lack of longevity. There wouldn't be people living long. But, but there's a principle there that, sometime, that there was a curse on that house. There would be no old man. I, I'm going to just tell you, I have lived long enough to see churches that have been cursed, and God cursed them by taking the elders out. I have seen it where ignorant, forgive me, young pastors... Got it in their mind they didn't need elders. To the point I've heard of stories where they said don't even come on certain service nights. I tell you, that's the spirit of this curse that was upon Eli. And there, was, there have been churches that were cursed and didn't even know it. I love our young people. we got to have young people. But I do believe that a church may be full of young people and have a curse on it. And the elders not even there. And the church doesn't even know it. Did you catch that? The church was cursed and the gray heads would not be there. That's what a curse, that's what a curse sounds like. But I want to tell you what a blessed church sounds like. It's a church that rings with the sound of old voices lifted in praise. Mingled with the voice of little babies crying. Sometimes we got to take them to the nursery. Sometimes you can't even teach because they get so loud. But that's a beautiful sound. A, a healthy, blessed church has elders. Elders with lifted hands and young men that are running the aisles and shouting. Hallelujah. You know what a you know what a blessed church is? It's a blessed church where there's elders, uh, Sister Johnson, that that come and they sit and we know where they're gonna sit. And that's their spot. And, and then there's young people over here that are that are worshiping with you and praising God together. Uh, I, I I've talked about it before, but one of the beautiful passages in in the bible describing a blessed people is in Zechariah 8 where God says thus saith the Lord of hosts there shall yet be old men everybody say old men and old women everybody say old women old men and old women dwelling in the streets of Jerusalem and every man his staff in his hand for very age God's saying Jerusalem's going to be blessed there's going to be old men and women leaning on canes and then the streets of the city shall be full of boys everybody say boys and girls everybody say girls talking about little kids playing in the streets thereof Jerusalem that blessed city God said there'd be old men on their canes and old women 
on their walkers. There'd be little kids running and smiling and jumping and dancing. That's a blessed church. I tell you, thank God for elders. Thank God for young people. Thank God for fruitful elders bringing forth fruit in old age. It's the will of God for you elder to keep producing, to keep being strong, to keep being faithful, to keep giving, to keep loving, to keep mentoring. Sometimes a devil will tell you you have no place I, I rebuke that lie in Jesus name you have a place you need to be fruitful in old age amen and one of the best ways to be fruitful is just being you I don't know how to tell you this but I'm going to say it anyway elders sitting on this pews provide strength for this framework of this church if all you did and that's not all you do but if all you did was come and sit here and have a gray, have gray hair, that provides power and strength. I don't know how else to say it. There's just something about it. I, I still think about Brother Molander sitting over there. The strength that came to me. The strength that came to us. And there's elders in this place. Brother Richard Pierce, and I shouldn't have started naming them. You're all across this place right now. Elders that are fruitful in the house of God. Why don't we lift our hands right now and thank God for fruitful elders. Come on, lift your voice. I need some children to lift your voice. I need some young people to lift your voice. Young man, thank God for elders. Hallelujah. Come on, middle-aged people, thank God for elders. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, you ought to really thank God. Why don't we clap our hands and thank God for elders? Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody say fruitfulness. Another sign of fruitfulness. But another thing that fruitfulness states, when somebody is fruitful, it says that the devil is not in control and God has all power. When somebody's fruitful, it says that the devil's not ruling this thing, but God is in control. Can I just tell you, if the devil could, he would have uprooted every single tree in the kingdom of God. I read in the book of 2 Kings about an arrogant Assyrian king by the name of Sennacherib. Sennacherib came against the, the, uh, the kingdom of Judah. He sent his, his guy, his emissary, uh, Rabshakeh. This was his mouthpiece. He sent him to Judah. I believe it was Hezekiah the king. And... Uh, and, and Sennacherib was one more proud, arrogant dude. He was, in, in fact, you can read it from Scripture, the way he defies God. But, but you can even read in, in, in history, they've found some, archae, uh, some of the archaeological digs. They have found these things, I think they're called um, the Sennacherib prism. They're basically clay, clay tablets. It'd be like the equivalent of our newspapers. They're these clay uh, uh, hexagonal or octagonal, six-sided, eight-sided clay deals. And on them is written all of this stuff. And, and one of them they found, I think they found three of them about uh, Assyria around the time of Sennacherib. But one of them describes Sennacherib. And it's kind of like how he would describe himself. And here is, here is uh, Sennacherib's self-description. Are you ready? He says, that he is Sennacherib, the great king, talking about himself, the powerful king, the king of the four quarters of the world, the wise shepherd, the favorite of the great gods. Sounds like a real humble dude, doesn't it? The guardian of truth, the lover of justice, the giver of help, who befriends the weak, a perfect man, a man of war foremost among all kings. That was Sennacherib. And Sennacherib came and through his man, he told Rabshakeh to tell Hezekiah that Judah is not going to be able to stand against me. Your God cannot stop me. Your God cannot prevent me. And then this is the specific words that Sennacherib said. He said, I will reduce Judah 
to a place of famine. I will bring you to where you have nothing to eat. In other words, there will be no food. There will be no fruitfulness. There will be no fruit. But God said in 2 Kings 19, he said of Sennacherib, you think you're great, you think you're the favorite of the gods, you're a guardian of truth, you're a perfect man. But God said, I'll put a hook in his node and lead him back where he came from. Amen. Can I just stop and tell you that the devil has no power over us? Amen. Can I just tell you again that God is in control? Amen. This is not the devil's vineyard. He does not have complete access to us. Any access he has is given to him by God. And God said of Sennacherib, I'll put a hook in his nose and lead him back where he came from. And then God said to Hezekiah, you ignore what he said about famine. This is what's going to happen. This will be the sign unto you that I'm going to help you. He said, you shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. This year, you're just going to eat of stuff that just pops up out of the ground. And next year, the second year, you're going to eat of stuff that springs from the same. In other words, stuff that the, the, the fruit that produced this year, it's going to produce more next year. And in the third year, you're going to sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. What God is saying, let me say it this way, what Sennacherib is saying is you will not have fruit. What God is saying is you will produce fruit. And I want to tell somebody tonight, when we begin to have fruitfulness, when in spite of what we're going through, we say, I'm still going to come to the house of God. I may have had a bad day, but I'm still going to give the fruit of praise unto the Lord. When we say, I don't feel like it, but I'm still going to call my Bible study and I'm going to teach a Bible study. When we say that in spite of all that's going on, I'm going to come early for music practice, early for prayer, and then I'm going to be at church. We're producing fruit and we are saying the devil is not in control. We are saying, Sennacherib, you don't dictate to this orchard. We're saying to the devil, you can't stop my worship. You can't stop my prayer. You can't stop my praise. When the devil sees our hands raised and the fruit of our lips giving thanks to Jesus' name, it's a testimony. The devil's not in control God is in control. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to bring forth some fruit. I've come to church to clap my hands. I've come to church to give him praise. I'm living for God, and I'm going to keep teaching Bible studies. Hallelujah. I'm going to come on a Tuesday and pray anyway. I'm going to come on a Saturday and I'm going to go on outreach anyway. I'm going to come faithfully to God's house regardless of what kind of week I've had because I'm telling by my fruitfulness the devil has no power. God has all power in heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. Amen. Anybody want to be fruitful tonight? Amen. Anybody come to give God some praise tonight? Amen. Anybody want to produce love when you... In spite of what you're going through, I'm going to tell you, it's a testimony that the devil is not in control. Amen. Amen. I, I don't want to go too much longer, but I want to move through some of this quickly. The next point I want to bring to your attention is that there is no higher calling than fruitfulness. There's no higher calling. Everybody say, no higher calling. Some of you may know, here's a little Bible trivia for you. What is the first parable in the Bible? Think about that. The very first parable in the Bible, and consequently that would make it the oldest in human history, is in Judges chapter 9. And it's when Gideon, the judge of, of, of Israel, uh, his youngest son by the name of Jotham, it's a story of Jotham and his brother Abimelech, and it's a parable. And some of you may remember this parable. The Bible says that uh, in the parable, the trees came. This was told by Gideon's son. The trees came, uh, first of all, to the olive tree and said, will you be king over us? And the olive tree said, no, no, I can't do that. Why would I leave producing olives to be 
a king. I, I'm supposed to produce olives. And then they, the trees went to the fig tree and said, would you be king over us? And the fig tra- tree said, why should I stop producing my fruit? And uh, I, I can't do that. And then they went to the vine. And the vine, with all the grapes, spoke to all the trees and said, why would we leave producing? Why would I leave producing grapes to be the king over you? And then the trees went to the bramble, basically went to a thorn bush. You know what a thorn bush produces? It produces thorns. Amen. You don't get a lot of fruit out of a bramble. And this fruitless, empty bramble, when asked to be king, said, well, I would be happy to. Where's the throne? Lead me to it. I'm here to tell you tonight, church, there is nothing that should call us away from being fruitful. Don't leave fruit bearing to be king. If somebody wants to promote you and say, you know, I'll I'll make you the president of the United States. If you'll quit winning souls, there needs to be somebody that says there's no higher calling that produces fruit. Don't leave. Listen, I've told people before, if, if, if maybe there's, there's soul winners in the church and, and they say, well, I, I, I want to start doing other things. My deal is always have a certain part of your life that is dedicated to producing fruit. Amen. There's a lot of ways to produce fruit, but one of the primary ways is in, is in winning souls or somehow praying for the lost. Whether you're teaching a Bible study or helping somebody teach or praying for the lost or teaching Sunday school or going on the bus or helping somebody do that. There's a million different ways or just loving people when they come to church. But I've told people that want to be involved in other things. Listen, if, if you want to be a musician, that's great. That's fruit. But don't quit teaching Bible study. Amen. If you're going to be a preacher, don't quit teaching Bible studies. Don't, don't leave Bible studies to be a brain surgeon. Don't leave soul winnings to be the president of the United States. There is no higher calling. Amen. Do you remember why we got the Holy Ghost in the first place? It's to save us, but also you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Amen. One of the great examples of this I think of is Brother Johnny Godare pastored one of the great revival churches of of America. And I don't know how many times he'd be preaching a camp meeting or a conference somewhere. And he'd talk about he had to get home on Saturday. So Saturday night he could teach a Bible study. He knew that I've got to keep being fruitful. I'm going to tell you, fruitfulness is a big deal to Jesus. And fruitfulness should be a big deal to us. Is there anybody that wants to be fruitful? Is there anybody that wants to produce love? Is there anybody that wants peace and joy in your life? If you feel that way, let's lift our hands and let God know tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says of Jesus, in one place they took him and they would have made him king. But somewhere in there Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm I'm about. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Don't let anything prevent you from being fruitful. And everybody said amen. Just a couple more things I want to I want to mention to you. In fact, I'll have our musicians come to, to let you know we're getting close to being done here. There's some things we need to do in order to ensure that we continue to be fruitful. First of all, we need to understand that if we're going to be fruitful and living for God, we can never do that separate from the church of God. We have to have one another. Amen. How many know we really need to be connected to the church? I said it, I guess, in the last couple of weeks. When you get isolated, your brain starts doing weird things. My brain doesn't work real healthy when I'm all by myself for a long time. I'm going to tell you, we need one another. Jesus said in John 15, abide in me. How many know we need to abide in Jesus? He said, abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, Jesus said, and you are the branches. We are the branches. Think of a 
Think of a grape vineyard. Think of a grape vine. That big grape vine and little tendrils and branches. That's what we are, part of Jesus. And without him, we are nothing. He said, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And without me, ye can do nothing. We got to have one another. Here's another principle. Bible, Bible lets us know this. We need, we already mentioned this, that we need one another. We need other trees. But this is reflected in, in nature. Some of you that may have fruit trees or know anything about it, you understand that part of fruitfulness occurs when one tree, the pollen from one tree gets on the other tree. Pollinization, you got to have it. And if your tree, some trees are self-pollinating, but most are not, you got to have a compatible pollinator tree nearby. In fact, sometimes we actually need bugs, pests, Bugs that will land on the other tree and bring the pollen over to us. Sometimes the things we think that are bugging us, that are messing with us. Sometimes troubles and trials are things that help us to be fruitful. It's bringing things into us that we need. And finally, I'm I'm just going to end with this. One of the interesting principles of, of trees being fruitful is that sometimes God has to prune things out of our lives. Has anybody ever experienced that? I've got, in fact, I went to my garage tonight to find some for my dad, but I got these big old, I don't know what you call them, but loppers. They look like giant scissors. They're tree trimmer thingies to chop a tree. And sometimes you got to get out there and you got to trim that tree. People that know these things know that it's important that you cut back some of the dead wood. You got to do it right. If you, if you over prune, it can cause too much vegetative growth. But if you under prune, the tree will produce wood instead of fruit. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus is the expert pruner. He just knows how much pruning to do. Church, sometimes, and I'm ending with this, sometimes things happen to us that God allows to happen in order to trigger fruitfulness. I heard a story about farmers, they will sometimes cause pain to trees. They will score the roots of the trees or even take a knife and and cut around the trunk of the tree they're making cuts in it and what this does sometimes is it, it it's like it wakes something up in that tree that says i need to produce some fruit i'm gonna hear you tell you tonight some things happen to us because god loves us and he wants us to produce fruit blessed is the man so that that man can produce fruit. God wants men and women that produce fruit. I want us to lift our hands right now. In fact, why don't we stand to our feet, lift our hands, and let's love the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, well, let's reach out to the Lord right now. Hallelujah. 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 I want to share a story with you that I read years ago, and then we're going to give us opportunity to pray. I was reading a book by uh, James Mishner. It's an author that I've, I've enjoyed through the years. Some of his books are better than others. But he wrote a book called The World is My Home. And in the, this story, if I remember right, I think it's even an appendix at the back of the book. He tells a memory, he was a, he was a, a little boy, next, and he lived on a farm. And there was a farmer next door that had an apple tree. This apple tree was an old tree, and it had used to produce a lot of, of, of fruit. It used to be in years past, this, this tree, you'd go out there, and, and it would be covered with apples everywhere around it. It was producing fruit. 
Well, this, this tree had somehow lost its ability. It lost its energy to bear any fruit at all. And one day, James Missioner, as a little boy, went by that tree, and there was a farmer standing by it. And he had a hammer, and he had eight big, long, rusty nails. Brother, brother, Mr. Missioner, as a little boy, asked the farmer, what you doing? He said, watch. And he took the first of the nails and he kind of bent down and, and placed the point of the nail on the trunk of the tree and started hammering that long, rusty nail into the tree. Ka-tunk, ka-tunk, ka-tunk. Hammered it all the way into the tree. And then he moved over a couple of inches and put another nail in. Ka-tunk. Hammered it all the way in and, and moved around the, the circumference of the tree, putting a nail in every few inches and James Mister said he never forgot that moment because this was in spring. That autumn, a miracle happened. He came by that tree and that tired old tree, something had happened. The tree had woke up and the tree began to produce a bumper crop of juicy red apples, bigger and better than he had ever seen before. And Jamie Missioner went to the farmer and he said, what happened? What, what happened to the tree? And the farmer said, well, when I hammered in those rusty nails, it gave that tree a shock to remind it of what its job was. And that job was to produce apples. James Missioner said, that's when I was a little boy, but years later I was about 80 years old. He said at that point I'd had some fairly large rusty nails hammered into my life. He said I'd had a quintuple bypass heart surgery, a new left hip, a dental rebuilding, an attack, a permanent vertigo. And he said, and like a sensible apple tree, I resolved to start bringing forth fruit. He said I was almost 80 years old. Now, most, now think about it, at 80, how much time have I got left, he wondered. And this guy, if you've read James Missioner's books, how many have read any of his books? Space, Texas, any of They're like 500, 700 pages. They're monster books. If he talks about anything, he starts <laughs> at the very beginning. And he said on average it would take him three years to write a long work. He said, I begin to think I'm 80. If I was to write, if I have 30 more books I want to write, that would take me 90 years. He said, that means I'd be 170 when I get done. He said, but between the years of 1986 and 1991, he said, I would write 11 books, publish seven of them, including two very long ones, have the other three completed in the third revisions awaiting publication. He said it was an almost indecent display of frenzied industry. But he said, this is how I did it. Every day I just got up, sat down at my typewriter, felt those rusty nails and started typing the question is did that old tree get back to work to produce apples only because of the shock of the rusty nails reminded it of death I don't know but James Mishner says by analogy I'm just telling you I labor diligently because of my age and the approach of time when I could work no more And he finished by saying, all I know is the job of an apple tree is to bear apples. And the job of a storyteller is to tell stories. And I have consecrated to that obligation. Now I'm talking to people in this church tonight. How many know God has called us to be fruitful? God has called us to be fruitful. Some of you remember when you first received the Holy Ghost, the dreams that God gave you. The excitement. The, I'm going to tell you, those dreams are still real. Trees grow, and, they, and you do enter into different seasons. We know that. Young men are for war. Old men are for wisdom. But I'm talking to children and young people. It's the will of God for you to be fruitful. I'm talking to young marrieds. That God has blessed you. But not so you can just line your pockets. Not blessed you just so we can somehow accumulate things but God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing I'm thankful for elders tonight 
And sir, can I tell you, God has you here for a reason. As we get older, things change. And, and certainly our bodies get tired. And God understands that. But when the devil begins to whisper, you have no place. You need to remind the devil that God has placed you here for a reason. And sometimes those rusty nails are goading us back into producing like we need to produce. I know I have you standing. I'm, I'm almost done right now. But I leave God tonight is talking to every man and woman in this place. Easter's coming. It's a year of, of new beginnings. It's 2021. Anybody want to be fruitful? Anybody want to be involved in the harvest? I believe as I'm talking, God is speaking to some. Maybe... Maybe your tree has been barren. Maybe there's been no fruit. Maybe you have drifted from your purpose. And God's calling you back tonight. And tonight I am going to open this altar for everybody in this house. And if there's anybody that would want to come to the altar and say, Jesus, I want to be fruitful. God, I want to produce in your vineyard. Then this altar is open right now. Come on, would you come with your hands raised? Would you come with a voice that says, Jesus... I want you to use me, Lord. God, I want to produce fruit. I want to produce love and joy and peace and long-suffering. God, I want to be fruitful in your vineyard. Come on, young people. God has called you to be fruitful. Young married, God has called you to be fruitful. Middle-aged, single, God has called you to be fruitful. Elders, children, God has called us to be fruitful. There are seasons of life and different types of seasons of gift of fruitfulness. But always there's a call. I want to be fruitful. I want to produce. Oh, that's beautiful. If that's how you feel, won't you just lift your hands and ask God, use me in your kingdom. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Oh, if you could see all that God has in store for you. Oh, if you could see what God wants to do. Come on, every hand raised, every voice lifted. Let's pray. Let's talk to the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, as they sing this, let this be a prayer. Use me, Lord. You can use anything. I want to be fruitful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use That's a lie of the devil. You are needed. You are important. You have a purpose. If you can use anything, oh, Lord, you can use, use me. me, Lord. Take my hands, Lord. Take oh, my feet. That's it, new convert. Come on, children. Jesus wants to use you. Let him use your talents. Let him use your abilities. Give him your mind, your heart, your soul, your spirit. Use me, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it. Why don't we pray together? Sister, find a sister. Brother, find a brother. Husbands and wives, families. Everybody pray. Oh, use me, Holy Ghost. Speak through me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my Can 
Take my hand.